now, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce members of my leadership team for the executive panel. I have blessed to have a superb executive management team. And their vision and their support over the last couple years has been absolutely integral to developing the strategic plan. So I'd like to ask them to come up to the stage now, Lisa Diller, Bill Hahn, Leslie Solomon, and Eric Weiner, so we can uh, continue to share with you the progress we've made, what's at stake and what it's going to take to fulfill the goals uh, that we've outlined in our strategic plan. Um, let me just tell you a little word about each of them. Lisa Diller is Chief Medical Officer of Pediatric Oncology at Dana-Farber and Boston Children's Hospital Center, uh, Cancer and Blood Dis <coughs> Disorder Center. She's also the Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs at Dana-Farber. She is also a Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School <laughs> and the Founder and Director of the David B. Perini Jr. Quality of Life clinic, which is a clinic aimed specifically at providing care for survivors of childhood cancer. Lisa is recognized across the world for her contributions in that area. This year, she's serving as a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, so we're not seeing quite as much of her as we usually do, but that was a great honor to be selected for that fellowship. Bill Hahn, who's sitting here to my left, um, MD, PhD. Bill chairs the Executive Committee for Research at the Institute, and he is our Chief Research Strategy Officer, as well as being Chief of the Division of Molecular and Cellular Oncology in the Department of Medical Oncology. He's also a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber, Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, and an Institute member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Leslie Solomon. Leslie joined Dana-Farber in 2017, as our Senior Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer and has accomplished remarkable things, some of which she'll talk about uh, just in the short time she's been here. She previously was the Founding Executive Director of the Brigham and Women's Hospital Innovation Hub and Director of Strategy and Innovation at the Brigham Research Institute. Leslie has more than two decades of executive experience in business development. She attended the Harvard Business School, and she's an expert in strategy and marketing at startups as well as early stage and late stage companies. And that's going to be absolutely critical for us as we expand our um, partnership with the private sector. And Eric Weiner, who I think you probably all know, is our senior <laughs> vice president for medical affairs, our chief clinical strategy officer, chief of the division of breast oncology, in the Susan F. Smith Center for Women's Cancers. And let me add that our Breast Cancer Center is, I think, unquestionably the very best breast cancer center in the world. And he's also the Thompson Chair in Breast Cancer Researcher, in Breast Cancer Research at Dana-Farber and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, program director for the Dana-Farber Harvard <laughs> Cancer Center, SPORE grant in breast cancer. So that's who they are. They're a pretty amazing bunch. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start with you, Bill, um, to talk about precision immuno-oncology. Um, so precision immuno-oncology continues to show great promise at Dana-Farber. We've launched the Center for Precision Immuno-Oncology, and we have great strength in both genomics and in immunotherapy. So tell us more about the impact and, 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 and power of this approach and our, what our continued growth in this area is going to look like and the role of combination therapies um, and how they will truly deliver personalized treatment for each patient and how that fits into the strategic plan. So uh, I think everybody understands that immuno-oncology is um, incredibly exciting. That excitement is well justified. Um, it's well justified for a couple of reasons. One is it's the beginning of the delivery on a promise that um, we all thought was there for, for decades. But it took a long time 
between the idea that the immune system could be used to treat cancer and the first evidence that you could actually make that happen. And I think that's what we're seeing now. This is the beginning of the delivery on that promise. The other thing is that um, I think people are really excited is that for the people who've been treated and respond, there is a small subset, unfortunately still small, but patients who live a very long time, some of whom may be cured for immunotherapy. And that's really unprecedented in much of what we've been, uh, we've been working toward that, but unprecedented, and I think that's part of what the palpable excitement is around immunotherapy. Now, I was asked to talk about precision immunotherapy. Um, I think if we talked about that three years ago, it, it didn't exist. So what's exciting to me about this is that we're putting not just words together that never were put together before, but concepts that can be uh, actualized. And um, in that sense, I think we have, um, building on the success that we've seen, three real challenges. One is, how do we predict who's going to respond and who's not going to respond? Because we need to know that um, not only to pick the right therapies, but allow us to understand how do we find things that will allow the other t types of patients to respond. On top of that, we have, to th we have the beginnings, we have a foothold for immunotherapy, but we need many other modalities to allow us to manipulate the immune system um, more effectively and actually more safely. And so by identifying those subsets, we'll be able to focus our attention on those that don't respond so that we can better come up with better therapies. And then related to that, as exciting as immuno-oncology is and the patients who respond is, is really remarkable, um, we've learned that unleashing the immune system against cancer can also be a dangerous thing. And there's, um, we're seeing toxicities that no one has ever seen in patients before. In fact, hospitals uh, like our partners, uh, both us and partners at the Brigham, um, have had to create new specialties of uh, providers who work with us to take care of the toxicities that occur when we use immunotherapy. We need to understand those better, we need to get on top of them, and ultimately we need to eliminate them from the care of patients. And so all of that, I think, fits perfectly into the strategic plan. Our, uh, from the research side of the strategic plan, we are trying to um, take stock of what we do well, think about the new opportunities, and also look at gaps. And I think we've taken that approach and look at, looked at immuno-oncology, and I think that what you'll see us doing over the next few years is one, redouble our efforts to understand each of those three things that I just mentioned so that we can find new science that's gonna lead to progress. One of the things that I think is both exciting and a little scary is that the, all the therapies we had were discovered 15 to 20 years ago, the targets. So what we need is the new targets that, uh, so we need basic research to understand how are we gonna manipulate the immune system better. The second is, um, it's not gonna take 15 years for us to turn those into new therapies. The turnaround time on discovery to delivery is now, uh, we're unhappy if we don't measure it in months and a year or two. And that should continue to progress and move faster. And to do that, we need to also um, think about new structures to support research, and the strategic plan is gonna allow us to do those things. And then finally, I think one thing that we've learned in all of cancer therapy is that single agents almost never work um, to affect cures. And so as excited as we are about each of the individual things we do, we have to think now, how do we do combination therapy and we can't rely on what we've done in the past, and that is empiricism of act, taking something from column A and something from column B and doing all the combinations. It's, we're simply too impatient to allow that process to happen, and it doesn't make sense for us to do that because it means that we're not delivering the best possibilities for each of our patients who participate in trials. And so I think the strategic plan and realigning how we think about that will allow us to achieve that objective in the future. Thank you. Leslie, accelerating innovation. Um, 
So Leslie is our Chief Innovation Officer, as you know, and uh, you are helping us and have helped us already um, develop uh, strategies and collaborations that enhance research and patient care while also delivering financial results and competitive advantage. Because to my mind, there are three ways to increase the revenue that comes into Dana-Farber that will be used to expand basic and translational research. I mean, that is, that's our trademark. We're 50% research, 50% clinical care. We want to keep that balance. But research is always a money-losing proposition. So we have, to, we have to keep on finding ways to support our research. And I think you know, there are three ways to do that. One is increase our clinical volume, and we want to do that anyway because we want to be able to treat more patients and deliver the kind of care that we deliver to more patients. The second is through philanthropy, but the third is through innovative partnerships with the private sector. And so, can you discuss how thinking creatively about sources of revenue helps to drive discovery and keep our science in-house longer so it'll create more value for Dana-Farber, including the commercialization of intellectual property through these unique partnerships? and how that fits into the strategic plan. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am just over a year into my time at Dana-Farber, and what I've learned in my first year is what you all have known for many years, is that the care that is delivered at Dana-Farber is out of this world, really, really and truly. And um, in the first six months while I was at Dana-Farber, I met with over 40 of our scientists. And so what I also learned was the science that is being done at Dana-Farber is also just incredible, really, truly amazing. And so as I looked at all of these new learnings and the experiences that I was having, my thought was, why should patients in New England why should patients that are close to here and maybe patients that have the funds to fly here, why should our care and our technologies and our science really be limited to, to those people? And typically, we've had ways to translate our science out of the Institute by partnering with industry and getting that science and turning that into to drugs and to, to new discoveries. Um, but I started to think about the clinical care that we were providing. And could we also take that care and get it out to more people? And Lori talked a little bit about uh, collaboration and the idea that you know, we, we have to find partners to help us move some of our work forward. And really, we can't do it alone. There's so much to be done. There's so much impact that we can have. And so by partnering with other organizations to get that work out is really how we move that forward. So. I started to learn about our cancer pathways that we had created, our clinical pathways, that many, many hours by physicians at Dana-Farber had been spent to deliver a pathway, which is a really a clinical decision support system. So a patient comes in, their tumor is a certain genomic makeup, and this is the first line of treatment. And then there's a decision tree that says, okay, this is the second line of treatment if that's not working. And obviously it's much more complicated than that, but then the third line of treatment. And these pathways were how our physicians, for the most part, were treating our patients. And if you looked around at community hospitals and hospitals across the globe, really, they weren't using the latest and greatest. And I sat in on some of these meetings and the, the fact was that our physicians were talking about the latest research, the talk that was given last week, and they were determining these pathways based on the newest information. And so I connected with Philips uh, Healthcare, which is, um, they had developed an IntelliSpace platform. Their IntelliSpace platform is meant to be a platform that could be used at any cancer hospital across the globe to help doctors at those hospitals treat patients. And they were interested in partnering with us around our pathways so that we could take our pathways, the way our doctors have developed their treatment plans, and put it onto their software platform so that patients 
in Indiana, Nebraska, in China, Japan could have access to the way that our doctors were thinking. And the exciting part about this partnership is that um, not only are we going to be able to impact the, you know, yes, we can impact hundreds and thousands of people here in New England, and that's incredible, but now we can <coughs> impact millions of people around the globe. And we can do that in a way that's going to drive revenue back to Dana-Farber to fund the research mission that Lori and Bill have talked about that is so important to these new discoveries. So that's one really exciting way that we're looking at doing this. And I think there, there are other things that we've actually, Lisa and I have already talked about some things that she's worked on, other clinical protocols, other technologies that we have at Dana-Farber that we can use to get out to the world. Um, but to fund that research mission, we also need to look at other, other things beyond our technology. And again, the science is the way that we've typically gotten um, our work out to the world. And we partner in ways with industry because the way that you get science out of a lab at Dana-Farber and get it into a patient is by technology transfer. So the transferring of that science out to industry where industry can do the things that they do best, which is actually develop drugs. And, um, and so we've done things a certain way in the past where we've partnered with industry. We actually license our science to, um, to a big drug company and they then turned it into a drug. Well, there are new ways of doing that that are really exciting. And when we partner at that stage, we might get a small royalty for partnering at that stage. The, our goal is actually to start to keep our science in-house longer. And so we've developed something called the Pipeline Project, which allows us to identify mid-stage science that is maybe one to four years away from translating to a patient. And the way that we're looking at this is by funding this work in-house ourselves. So rather than sending it out early to a partner, we're keeping it in-house longer. We're developing an accelerator fund internally that will allow us through philanthropy to continue to own the work that's being done so that when we partner that mid-stage science, when it's ready, we will have created a lot more value will have taken a lot of the risk out of that science. So the upside for Dana-Farber will be much higher. The other thing that's most important is that we will actually have accelerated the pace at which this science will get to patients. Because sometimes by partnering early, things get slowed down, things take longer. We will speed up the time to get this work to patients. And we will also, again, create more value for Dana-Farber. So it's a little bit higher risk, but the reward will be higher as well. And so we're really excited about our, uh, the opportunity that exists um, to do that and to fund that in-house with philanthropy to, um, to move that work forward. And, then, and, then, and there are other creative partnerships we're, we're working on as well, um, which you know I, I'm excited to be able to talk about those one day. But the, the, the idea is to, um, to increase our risk a little bit and there are different ways we can do that, but also to, to accelerate the, the time that it gets to patients and also um, increase the reward. So lots of exciting things that we're doing um, on the innovation side through collaboration. So if you pick projects at the mid-stage, mm -hmm. you estimate that to get that project to a point where it's highly sought after and will bring us significant revenue because we'll have 10 or 20 percent royalties, etc. What what's the magnitude of the fund that you'll need per year going forward? It's yeah. So so each project will really be about two to four million dollars a year, and we've anticipated that in order to move this work forward, we really need to raise between 20 to 40 million dollars because not every single one of those projects is gonna be successful. So in order for us to take this risk, we need $40 million in this new accelerator fund to really accelerate this work, keep it in-house, and find the successes that will move this forward, so. So we need a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, um, you have already transformed 
uh, the breadth of our clinical care for our youngest patients. Um, and clearly, the heart of everything we do, whether we do it in the laboratory or at the bedside, are our patients that we serve and that we're honored and privileged to serve. And we remain recognized for the world-class care, care we provide to our patients. Um, I have received probably 200 letters or emails from patients or their family members since I arrived two years ago. And all of them have said, we have never experienced the quality of care anywhere else that we're experiencing at Dana-Farber because we feel like we're surrounded by a family that cares for us, ranging from our doctors, the nurses, the physician assistants, the nutritionists, the social workers, the janitors, the volunteers, the parking garage attendees, the security guards. And I, you know, when I wake up every morning and I think, sometimes it's really tough to be the CEO of a hospital in Massachusetts. This is what gets me to work every day. Um, this, the knowledge that we are delivering exceptional care to our patients. So my question to you is, as a provider, of exceptional care to our youngest patients. Can you comment on some of the unique challenges that you have to address with this very precious population, the future, the children are our future. So what, what can we do to, to make it even better? You know, you use the word privilege in your question that you feel privileged and certainly seeing what we do as a privilege and an opportunity is, is um, a big part of being a pediatric cancer doctor. Eric and I were noticing the slides that were being shown um, during your talk and there was a slide of one of my colleagues, Sun Young Pai, and she was examining a patient and it was such a, a great photograph of what we do. It wasn't only that the child was cute, but it was the eye contact between the physician and the patient at that moment that spoke you know, more than I can tell you about the relationships that we have with our patients and how we develop them. What's unique about pediatrics, perhaps, is that you know, obviously the children are all ages. It's different to take care of a six-month-old than it is a 16-year-old. A, a six-month-old, you want to be sure as a pediatrician to keep that child as much in their mother's arms as possible. A 16-year-old, you want to get back to school as much as possible. And the challenge of choosing a diagnostic or therapeutic plan is often based upon those kinds of family needs. Um, the other challenge is that our diseases are incredibly rare. Thankfully, those of you who have children or grandchildren, the chance of getting a childhood cancer is, is incredibly um, unfortunate for a family dealing with it, but very, very unusual. So we're dealing with the shock of a family having something unexpected, and we're supporting a whole family through a diagnostic and therapeutic journey. Coming up with a diagnosis and a therapy in a setting of a very, very rare disease requires the kind of expertise that the faculty of uh, pediatric oncology and really across the institute um, have been um, blessed with resources at the Dana-Farber and from philanthropy to be able to do. You know, you mentioned that we are um, one of, uh, or the only pediatric and adult U.S. News and World Report winner as a joint program. And it's really one of the um, greatest things about working at the Dana-Farber is having my colleagues across the institute, adult and pediatric, because the investment made in cancer is an investment made in precision immuno-oncology or new drug development that we benefit from in pediatrics just as much as the medical oncologists benefit, even though it's such a rare disease and that couldn't happen somewhere else. When I think about the future going forward, I think a lot about um, expanding um, what we do and how we do it across the Institute again, um, working with um, the group thinking about pre-cancer and um, people at risk for cancer, and that includes children, and collaborating with um, 
the members of the faculty like Irene who are working on figuring out how to make diagnosis without a bone marrow or how to figure out who's at risk, an area I'm quite interested in and working on during my fellowship this year, as you mentioned. <clears throat> and then thinking further about the adolescence and into young adulthood and that sort of 18-year-old or 21-year-old division really doesn't make sense in the, in, the, um, in the age of precision medicine where we know something about the genetics of the tumor and the age of the patient matters less. And understanding the genetics, the, the understanding the immune environment, understanding the biologic behavior of the cancer is much more important in coming up with a therapy than it, um, than it might have been in the past when we just used an, an age and maybe uh, what something looked at or under the microscope. And then um, finally, uh, another area dear to my heart is survivorship. When we cure a child, we hopefully give them nine decades of life forward. And that is something we have to keep in mind when we choose therapies. And I personally have been lucky to be working with the Perini family over all these years who recognized many years ago the importance of um, uh, caring for and studying survivors to inform our therapies today. And I hope to continue doing that in the future along with my colleagues so that we can choose therapies today that we know will allow um, children to become young adults, members of society who have families of their own and live healthy lives. Thank you. The FDA is soon going to approve, uh, not approve drugs unless they've been tested in children. How do you think that's going to affect pediatric care? Well, I, you know, one of the challenges has always been in getting new drugs to children is there's really very little or there was very little incentive for the pharmaceutical industry to invest in that because of the rarity of the diseases. And the FDA has really from um, the efforts of p parents lobbying mostly, um, has come up with ways to incentivize and regulate um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry to pay attention, both here and in Europe, to pay attention to the need for pediatric drug development and to give companies um, actually financial incentives for doing so. So um, I think it's terrific. I think it's going to bring new drugs to kids, and that's, it already has, actually, and, and um, I think that's wonderful. Eric. Um you're the Senior Vice President for Medical Affairs. You're our Chief Clinical Strategy Officer. And you are <coughs> an unbelievably wonderful mentor. Um, there isn't any faculty member in the breast cancer group who hasn't said to me at one time or another, we are so lucky to have Eric Weiner as our leader because he really cares about each of us and has mentored us. So you're really laser focused on, on our need to retain and nurture Dana-Farber's top talent. And I can tell you that there isn't a day that goes by, or certainly a week that goes by, when I don't hear about some other institution, whether it's Morris Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson or other institutions, who are not trying to recruit our best faculty members <laughs> away from us. Occasionally they succeed, but 90% of the time, we keep them here, and it's because of people like Eric, who has created such loyalty amongst our younger faculty that they, and, and, and a environment and a culture at Dana-Farber that is so mission-driven that we usually manage to keep them, although it does usually cost us some money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one example is um, the uh, huge effort by Memora Sloan Kettering to recruit some faculty members in breast cancer, and by another institution to actually recruit Eric. <laughs> <laughs> All of which uh, we prevented them from doing. So um, <coughs> this uh, support you know, includes providing career guidance and mentorship to, to all of our institution's faculty members, but especially to our early stage tenure track faculty members. So tell us what Dana-Farber is currently doing to build the next generation of leaders in cancer care and cancer research as part of our strategic plan. 
Well, I will, but I just have to say, not to doubt your word, that the audience may want to check out what you've said with some of my colleagues across the room to make sure that it's actually accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, I try. Um, and um, I know so many of you in this room, whether uh, I have a number of patients here, I have colleagues here, I have friends here, um, I hope I have something new to say. Um, in many ways, I think we're really quite fortunate because we live in a great city. We have a truly remarkable institute. There's incredible collaboration between scientists and clinicians and between doctors and scientists and everyone else who works at Dana-Farber. And that makes it appealing to work at Dana-Farber. Um, We've been very, very successful over the years. But as you all know, we can't just rest on our laurels and we have to keep trying to be better. And Laurie is exactly right. Uh, a week doesn't go by when there isn't someone being recruited somewhere because we really have an amazing group of individuals who work at Dana-Farber. Um, I think in many ways, you can think of the whole strategic plan as focusing on the people who work at Dana-Farber. Because without those people, what would we be? I mean, we would really be nothing. We, we need the clinicians, we need the scientists, we need everyone else who supports them. And so our strategy very much has to be about making Dana-Farber a place that everyone is simply delighted to come to work to. And sure, we'll always lose a person or two because in truth, occasionally for someone, there really is a better job out there. There are leadership roles in other places. But so often what we find is that even those very appealing positions turn out not to be so appealing when people think about leaving Dana-Farber. But I think in order to do this, what, what we have to do is we have to make sure that we have the right support systems for researchers and clinicians and people who do both research and, and clinical work. Um, in many ways, unlike what Leslie was talking about, where sometimes we have to um, make an investment and there's risk, I'd actually argue there's almost no risk here because when we support individuals who are so very talented, it, it's paid back to us in spades. And of course, the, the happiest, most satisfied, most content employees in all areas are the ones that, that perform the best. I do think, just in closing, that mentorship is absolutely key. And that mentorship is about career mentorship, it's about scientific and clinical mentorship, and a little bit of it is about life mentorship, because a lot of the people who are in our midst are people who are struggling with life decisions um, that they often come to uh, the people who they work with closely to ask questions about what house to buy and how to manage daycare situations and other such things. And we really have to be open to listening and to, to hear people um, and to do our best to provide the kind of support. And in my role, what I've been trying to do is to try to make sure that we have mentors and that we have mentors for mentors, since um, even those of us who have been doing this for a while still really need a lot of help. Thank you, Eric. So you've each articulated beautifully um, how we're transforming cancer care and cancer science. I'd like to close, actually, by asking each of you to, to share a brief story which, which helps to articulate why our work at Dana-Farber is so critical. And I'm going to start with you, Eric. I'm going to go in the reverse order. OK. Um, so I got permission at 8 o'clock this morning to share this story. Um, I, um, as, as somebody who both does research and it takes care of patients, I have to say that taking care of patients is ultimately what makes me get up in the morning, um, even though I essentially do it one day a week. And 
as you know, the ultimate goal is to prevent cancer. The next goal is to um, make sure that everyone is cured. And finally, um, I think where we are now is hoping that most people are cured and, and some people will manage to live with cancer but live for a very, very long time and, and live well with their cancer. I spend a lot of my professional life taking care of women who have metastatic breast cancer, an illness that has become increasingly a chronic illness, but it's a chronic illness that ultimately threatens people's lives. And so um, the brief story is the story of a woman named Sue who said I should feel free to use her name and I never needed to ask, um, who was diagnosed with what's called HER2 positive breast cancer about 14 years ago. She was treated for it. Um, unfortunately, it recurred. It became metastatic about five years ago. And in the course of those five years, she has been on about four or five different treatments on three different clinical trials, has, in spite of all of this treatment, done amazingly well. She said, will you show them the picture of you and me from mile 45 of the PMC this year? Because, in fact, this was her eighth PMC. Um, she modeled in a fashion show that another patient of mine, Carol Shawi, who's somewhere right over there, um, uh, ran a few weeks ago. And um, she is living life to the fullest. And hopefully she's going to live with this for a very long time. But she and everybody else I take care of remind me of the fact that there's a real urgency in what we do. You know, 10-year delays for new treatments just don't work. We have to come up with new treatments as soon as possible to help people today, but also to change the field tomorrow. Thank you. Lisa. Well, I'll tell a timely story. Um, the day before the first game of the World Series, a patient of mine who's not doing well is an incredible fan. He's in his early 20s. And um, I called Lisa Sherber. You might rec recognize her name. She was on the video talking about Halloween last night. She's our play lady. And I said, you got any tickets? And she said, for who? And I told her. And I said, it might be hard to manage this. She said, yeah, I got it. She calls me back. I got the tickets. Can I go bring them over to him? Sure, I say. Well, my patient required an ambulance watched the game in a gurney, a nurse went with him, the guys who drove him in the ambulance stayed the whole time to help adjust the gurney and got to watch the game. <laughs> 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 All volunteer. <laughs> Prep for this took about 100 emails because of the pharmacist making up the pumps that they needed to make up. Oh my God. It is incredible. It is an unbelievable program to work in because every nurse, every clinic assistant, every pharmacist, the ambulance drivers, the docs who take care of him, we all were there for this experience for him. And he knew it. And I watched that game. I felt great about two things, I should say. So that's what's special about Dana Farber. Thank you. So before I joined Dana Farber, um, a little boy at our school in Brookline um, got sick with leukemia, and it was a good family friend of ours. Uh, he was nine at the time. He was friends with both of my boys, and um, he was then treated at Dana-Farber, and I was able to actually, being at Brigham, walk, th walk through a couple bridges and go over to see him. Um, and then when I got this opportunity at Dana-Farber, I would get to see him even, even more. And um, again, was blown away by the care that he was given. His family would call me, they would tell me stories, we would spend time together. Um, he ended up getting a bone marrow transplant and in April of um, 2017, he, um, that was his bone marrow transplant and then he went home. And in February of 2018, um, he went back to school. And, um, sorry. <laughs> And Saturday night, I was at a Halloween party, and he, was, and he and his brothers were the three amigos <laughs> and his little mariachi outfit. And to be able to see him 
at a Halloween party with you know a bunch of kids and a bunch of families, being able to just hang out like a regular kid is um, is really why what we do is so important. So when I was a first year fellow, I saw a patient um, who came to Dana Farber um, as sort of a hail mary. He had been to he and his family had been to several hospitals in the area, and every hospital said. I'm sorry you have this rare sarcoma. We, we don't have anything for you. Um, our best advice is to try to spend time with your family and get your affairs in order. And they came to Danny Farber and saw me, a first year fellow, um, and, um, and George Dimitri. And we, George and I, and George uh, said, we're going to take this, we're going to do something differently. And we got a surgeon at the Brigham who was going to do a very difficult, uh, nearly impossible operation. It was a success, um, removed the tumor that was taking uh, up most of his abdomen, put him on a lot of really toxic chemotherapy drugs that did nothing, but temporized until it turned out that he had a GI stromal cell tumor, which at the time nobody knew anything about, but George had started a trial using Gleevec in this disease, and he was one of the first patients on the trial. The tumor melted away. He had four or five years of uh, the only side effect of having a little rash on his forehead, which his wife liked because it gave him more color. <laughs> and um, failed that therapy, went on to a second line therapy, lived another five years, allowed, walked down the aisle with his three daughters and saw two of his grandchildren um, uh, be born. And so, that story to me um, encapsulated why we all became oncologists, that there were terrible diseases that we knew nothing about, that we would do science and figure something out and be able to affect people's care. And what I think is great about that story to me and why I remember it so much is that at the time, it was an uncommon event for a patient to experience that. And now it's common. All of my colleagues see this every day. And that's crazy, but great crazy. The second is, it doesn't take 15 years to develop a drug. It takes sometimes a few months or years. And that is crazy. <laughs> we couldn't imagine that. And finally, cancer, when we all started training, was empiricism of the highest degree, the best empiricism in the world, but still empiricism. And we're finally to the point where we only do things because there's a rationale. We're not always right, but there's a thought process. And I think that that's really, truly the breaking point of how we think about cancer. It's not going to be about just trying lots of stuff because we can, but trying the right stuff and knowing how to understand the results of what we try so that we can make things better. And that's what that patient encapsulates for me.